Horror games have been a huge part of the gaming industry for the past four decades, and they continue to captivate players to this day. From AAA high-quality, high-budget games to no-cost indie horror games that are still played by millions of people every day. Well, in today's video, I'll be trying to make a full horror game in only 30 days, and I'll be giving myself three simple rules. I must write all of the game's code from scratch, I have the right to get as many 3D models and sound effects from the internet, and I must have a fully functioning horror game by day 30. For this project, I decided to use the High Definition Render Pipeline even though it's typically resource intensive. Without it, I wouldn't be able to get the same atmosphere and overall creepiness from the game. Let's talk about planning. Planning beforehand is crucial for successful game development. I use services like Notion and Trello when I make my videos, but I never did when I started making this horror game. I didn't have a story or any ideas for the gameplay. At first, I wanted to make a horror survival game where you are stuck in a giant maze, but then I realized that the idea isn't so original. And then I had an idea where the player is kidnapped by some supernatural grandpa and they have to escape their house. But that sounded like another game where you have to escape an old person's house. I did try adding a dog to make it different. So you have to rescue the dog as well. But at that time I just gave up on the idea. Stranger Things. I watched the show 11 times, so why wouldn't I make a horror game that takes place in the Stranger Things universe? The show already has a few creepy monsters, and we can always invent some new ones. So while I was making the main mechanics of the game, I was also writing the storyline. Unlike my previous game, for this one I wanted the player to have a full body. I got the model and the animations from Xamo, and to transition smoothly between the walking states, I used the blend tree. For the hands, I used avatar masks to override other animations over the walk animations. In the animator controller, I set up three animation layers. one for the body, one for the right arm and one for the left arm. I set up the item screen so I can easily assign the hand that the item will be picked up and what animations to play. I always use humanoid avatars for easier animation retargeting, but this came with a pretty big flaw. I like animating hands directly in Unity, because it's simple and quick. But since my model was set up as a humanoid avatar, I couldn't animate the arms in Unity anymore, and had to import the mesh into Blender, animate it there, and then export it using the Better FBX Exporter plugin. After a bit of trial and error, I was able to pick up my flashlight with no problem. But that isn't a flashlight. At the beginning of the video, I did say that I can download models from the internet, but flashlights look easy to model, so I made one. To make the hands follow the camera vertically, I used Unity's animation rigging package and added an empty game object in front of the camera, anchored to it, and set up a rig to the player's mesh. Now when the player looks up or down, the body follows the empty game object and rotates accordingly. This is usually done for third person games, but it worked just fine for mine. Let's start making the map. I had a brief idea about what the story was about, so I started out by downloading a house asset pack from the Unity Asset Store, from which I ended up using only the basement. Since the grandfather clock was a really big thing in Season 4 of Stranger Things, I decided to add it in. It didn't really serve a purpose, besides disappearing after the player turns on the breaker. Then I started working on the start area of the game. And you might be wondering, what's the storyline? Well, I call this game Darwin's Project. Darwin, the founder of the Darwin Project, disappeared mysteriously after his lab shut down a few years back. He was known for the crazy experiments he did on humans and animals, but no one knows where he is now. Some speculate that he died, but our protagonist, let's call him Adam, thinks that he knows the truth about what's really happening. He made the choice one late night to go to a forest that had been off limits to the public for a few months after Darwin's lab closed. He believes that Darwin's disappearance has something to do with the forest. Adam grabs his flashlight from the car and enters the forest. He's immediately greeted with a long path surrounded by barbed fences. Following it, he begins to notice construction equipment like forklifts, rollers and dump trucks. Then in the distance, he notices some lights that might be a sign of life. Did he find what he was searching for? Well, no. Instead, um, he discovered Darwin a little really brick hut covered time. in blood with big police cars in front of it and unusual body parts lying about the area. A few seconds later, he hears distant roars. He rushes into the cabin and discovers a grandfather clock that was slowly ticking and that had a bright red light coming from it. There was a ton of furniture in the room, along with the desk lamp that was on. As he approaches the desk lamp, the room's lights all go out and the desk lamp was conveniently pointing toward the crossbar. When he finds a boarded up entry to the breaker in a different room, he pries the boards open and turns on the the breakers. The grandfather clock stops ticking, and upon a closer look, he discovers that it has mysteriously vanished. With nothing else to do, he rushes back to the forest's entrance, but as he does, he notices that one of the fences had fallen and revealed a different route. He keeps venturing deeper into the forest, despite knowing that whatever killed those cops could also kill him. After about 5 minutes of traveling, it appeared as though the forest was at an end. However, Adam discovers a large lake. He follows the shoreline and notices a crane in the distance. This indication of humanity is also a hint of the thing that killed those people, but Adam still doesn't back down. A wooden watchtower was located next to the crane. As he approaches, he hears someone yelling for help. 
AI. Everyone's talking about it, and its influence has only grown over the past couple of years. From ChatGPT writing essays, to Mid Journey and Dali 2 making realistic and cinematic images in a matter of seconds. I used all of these and still do on a daily basis, but there's one that seems way crazier. This is Eleven Labs. It's a generative AI text-to-speech and voice cloning tool that can create the most realistic AI voices. And what better thing to use it for than to make voice lines for my game? The free package only allows up to 10,000 characters per month, which seems a lot, but it isn't. So I bought the starter package for only one dollar. Anyway, I wrote out voice lines for the player and for Pete. In Unity, I created a modular voice line scripted object where I could add an audio file, text for the subtitles, and an optional slot for another voice line scripted object if you want somebody to reply to it. Don't even ask me how I made the reply script. I worked half a day on it and it's very buggy. So this is how it turned out. Thank you so much, but could I ask you for one more favor? Can you please bring me back to the entrance? I really hurt my leg and I can't risk going alone. So, what are you even doing here? We came here, uh, I got lost in the woods, found this watchtower and planned to stay here until morning. We? Who is we? I mean, uh, okay, I'm a part of the Darwin Project. We are planning to build a research lab here. Those creatures you heard everyone talk about, they are real, from another world, a mirror of ours, but infested with evil and darkness. And we are trying to get rid of them. Those things with long arms, no face. There are more of them. They are called Demogorgons. Millions exist, most not in our world. They, they are particularly drawn to those who are bleeding or injured. Bro, there's literally one right there. Yeah, so that wasn't supposed to happen. I learned a few helpful stuff from my previous games, Monster AI, so here is how I made the new one. The whole script is based around these states right here. On every update, the script checks if the monster state is idle. If true, it waits a random amount of time, then it finds a random location within the wand range for the monster to walk and sets the state to walk. When it arrives at its destination, the state gets set back to idle, and the loop begins. Now the monster can wander around the map. To see the player, added a collider to the monster that triggers when the player enters it. This runs the check sight function that casts a ray from the eyes of the monster to check if the monster can actually see the player. This is necessary so he doesn't get aggroed through all. If the monster can actually see the player, the state changes to chase. Then going back to the update void, the monster starts following the player and if the player is within the attack range, it will run the attack function. And lastly, if the monster doesn't see the player for a number of seconds, it will go back to its idle state. The script itself is more complicated than this, but I, I don't think it's necessary to explain it all. I ran into a really big problem. Due to the sheer amount of trees and messages rendering all at the same time, the game got extremely laggy. To fix this, I added a collision culling. This stops rendering objects that aren't seen by the player. Not only the ones that he's not facing, but also objects that are obscured by other objects. I also had some very unoptimized scripts, so after fixing those two, I got most of my FPS back. Back to Pete. You didn't really think that he's trustworthy, right? When you get him back to the gate, he ends up trying to snitch on you. But before he does... Yeah, I spent too much time debugging Pete that I actually created a bond with him and I really feel sad killing him. But it is what it is, right? When you get closer, you see that the paper he was holding all this time was a map. On it, there can be seen antenna symbols and a question mark near one. When you finally arrive at it, you will find C4 that you will use to blow up the forest. There are four small buildings where you will be placing the C4. When you do, you will run back to the entrance and... <laughs> That's the end. I know, for 30 days, it doesn't seem like a lot. But while making this game, I also had to study for two exams that by the time I'm editing this video, I already took. I learned tons of stuff from this experience, not only about game development, but also about organization. Also, if you're wondering if I'll be releasing the game, well, I won't be. The game isn't even close to finished and has many bugs. Maybe if this video gets 20,000 likes, I'll try finishing it.